Good morning. Happy Friday, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Just get started in just a moment. Morning, everyone. So glad to have you join us today. Hope everybody's got their cup of coffee with them. Morning. We're just gonna give another moment for folks to join before we start up. All right, I think we've got some critical mass. So um, good morning, my name is Bryn Oakleaf. I'm the Efficiency Excellence Network Program Manager. Um, so nice to have you with us today. Um, really excited about this training. Um, and I can tell from the number of folks joining us, we're almost at 50 joining us today. So looking forward to some great conversation. Um, please, uh, it, you know, feel free to raise your hand. We want this to be conversational, um, uh, as well as use the chat box uh, to ask questions. We'll take breaks throughout the training to answer those, um, just so we're making sure we're not leaving things till the end. Um, if you are an EEN member, I will automatically apply credits, um, education credits for your attendance today. Uh, so no, no, no need to log those with me afterwards. I'll go ahead and do that for you. Um, and if you aren't registered already, please consider registering for the Better Buildings by Design Conference. It's scheduled on April 27th and 28th. Um, we're very excited to have that as an in-person event and, and looking forward to seeing everyone there next month. So with that, I will leave it to Chris, let you kick it off. Um, and again, looking forward to, uh, looking forward to this training. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brent. Um, so I'm going to share my screen here and I just want to do a quick introduction of myself because you probably don't know me. I, I'm in Eastern Mass in Rhode Island, regional sales manager for uh, Mitsubishi Electric. And uh, Mike Gambaroni is my counterpart out in Vermont. Um, he also has Joe Armenti working for him. I believe they're both on the presentation today. Um, I'm sure they can chime in on the chat with their contact information. Um, I'm also an ACA design instructor. So Mike talked me into working with Efficiency Vermont today and teaching a little bit of duct design, particularly when it comes to our low static and mid static air handlers. Um, as we go through, if you have any questions, please, like Bryn said, put them in the chat or um, raise your hand, any, any way to get somebody's attention. Um, I'd rather we answer them as we go. So that way, uh, when we get to the math specific questions, um, it's timely and we're not going backwards. All right. So I do have a, a full presentation of two, almost two hours today, uh, but that is to accommodate uh, those questions and answers. And there will be a time at the end uh, where you can ask any other specific questions with, when it comes to Mitsubishi and stuff like that too. So um, as we go, um, I look forward to seeing and hearing from you. Um, this can be a little direct, so I'm just gonna give you uh, um, some background with system design as we get into duct design. All right. So first off, in order to do duct design, you have to follow the design process with HVAC. There's actually more than one manual, right? So manual J load calculations is without a doubt the first step before you can design ductwork. And uh, typically, you know, you're going to perform a load calc on the entire structure in order to find out how much BTUs you need, right? This is very, very basic. I'm not doing a uh, manual J class today. Um, I do teach that maybe another day. Obviously, we could spend a whole day on that. Um, but it's really important. And I like to, to kind of talk about manual J as the map. You need to have the map before you enter the woods. You can't size and design a system without the map, right? So really, really important you do that first step first. And if you're gonna design a new duct system, it doesn't matter if it's low, mid, high, static, even a system replacement in order to verify the duct work, you need to break the manual J load calculation down to room by room or zone by zone, all right? Um, so in order to do this, software is recommended. You, you might be able to get a heat loss doing um, something very abridged or uh, Excel document based, but you're not gonna be able to do the heat gain. So there's ACA Manual J version eight approved software on their website. If you go to ACA.org, you can click on um, software and see all of the approved software. 
Um, there is longhand in short forms. Don't recommend it when it comes to manual J, but I'm gonna teach you that when it comes to manual D today. Obviously, in order to select the right equipment, you should be following ACA manual S. And this is what is code in the International Residential Code. And I'm not gonna read what's on the screen. Basically, you size the system uh, based on manual J and you select the correct size based on manual S without drastic oversizing, right? So this applies to every heating and cooling piece of equipment. There's minimums and maximums as you go. So once you know this, the, what's needed for the building, you select the right piece of equipment. If it's ducted, then we get to manual D. So it goes J, S, then D. This is the third part of that design pie. And in manual D, what we do is we calculate the friction rate we need, which I'm gonna walk you through today. We're gonna size the ducts. We always do the runs first and then the trunks. And then of course, we're gonna verify velocity to make sure that even though we're getting the right volume of air there, it's not too noisy because it's moving too fast or it doesn't mix in the room because it's moving too slow. So um, we're gonna walk through these steps today and apply it to low static and mid and high static air handlers, all right? That's the key. So before I get rolling, um, when it comes to the math portion, I wanna make sure everybody knows, and I, I personally was taught some really bad rules of thumb when it comes to duct calculators. Now, of course there's round and there's the, the rectangle slide rule style. Um, every time I would teach this class in person, people would bring their own and I'd always see little marks by 0.1 or 0.08 because that was the rule of thumb that they were taught. And what I wanna to explain to you guys today is that may work in one in a hundred houses. And when you change the air handler, the friction rate changes. And that's because your available blower static changes. And it's possible when you make duct transitions that the total equivalent length of the longest duct run changes. So when you do this, this is not static pressure. This is friction loss that you're setting on your duct calculator per 100 feet. And there's two pieces of information you need in order to calculate the right friction loss. The first one is how much available blower static pressure you have. So you start with something for the air handler and you deduct these devices that are in the way. And then the total equivalent length and actual feet of the longest duct run. Because if you can get air to the longest run, we have balancing dampers to then uh, balance the rest of the system for the rest of the house, right? So those are the two pieces of information and I'm gonna walk you through that. Chris, we do have yes. one question. Um, what do you got? Uh, is this information only for residential design? Uh, how would it be different for commercial design? Yes, so this is a manual D is residential. Um, commercial has a different design process. Typically velocities and static pressures are much higher. Um, and you know, there's just some different rules when it comes to duct design, uh, when it comes to commercial. So I apologize uh, if you were expecting commercial. Today is, is residential duct design. But we can likely follow up with a, another training that's focused on commercial too. That would probably be the best, yeah. Thanks, Brian. Okay. All right. Um, all right, so uh, in order to do this, uh, yesterday, all the attendees were sent um, uh, two PDF copies uh, one of them is the friction rate worksheet, and the other one is the duct sizing worksheet. So the first piece I'm going to walk through is the friction rate, uh, calculating friction rate or the friction rate worksheet. And I personally like the one that was taken out of the old manual D just because there's a great chart at the bottom. This chart will tell you what you need to do if the friction rate that you calculate is too low or too high for normal residential duct design. So that's why I like using that one on the new manual D that was published in the last 10 years. They took that little chart out off of the worksheet and it doesn't help an instructor not to have it. So I like to pass out the old one. The rest of the top piece is the same. Math stays the same. All right. So in order to walk through this sheet, the first item that you need to know is the manufacturer's blower data. So you need to know what the external static pressure we're starting with and the volume of air you're designing around. I'm gonna get on how to find this and how to choose this. And then we deduct all of the component pressure losses. And this isn't, uh, you don't have to have all of these in your system. This is just a little checklist, so you don't forget anything. And the component pressure losses are actually based on the volume of air you're putting through it. So if you have a big air filter that's four or five inches pleated, you might have a much lower pressure loss when you put, let's say 300 CFM through it compared to, when you put 600 CFM through it. So the pressure loss would go up with more volume of air. 
All right. It looks like Andy didn't get that email. I apologize, Andy. We'll make sure that Efficiency Vermont follows up with that with you. I would check your, um, your junk mail too. All right. Um, then you'll see we deduct all of those CPL component pressure losses from what we started with to end up with what's available, your available static pressure. And if you remember from the previous screen, that's the number that's needed for the top side of your equation. Of course, we add up your supply side total equivalent length and return side total equivalent length for the longest run, not all of them, it's not a stock list, to get the bottom side. And then we do the math. It's actually pretty simple, okay? Um, but it's not as simple as using a rule of thumb, so a lot of people don't walk through it. So we wanna make sure you're doing this right. And if you're out there verifying, because the, the later part of this presentation today is a little bit on diagnostics, figuring the right friction loss for the job, what's installed is really important to know what the impact on the airflow is, okay? Particularly when we get to low static air handlers. So we're looking for your friction rate, your design value. So if you're working with Mitsubishi, uh, Mitsubishi has a great website, mylinkdrive.com, where you can click on the system you're working on and pull up the submittal for anything without a password. You can get it right on your phone, any browser. Um, really, really simple to find and use. So what I did was I just pulled out the one ton low static air handler today, just to show you where to find this information. All right. So this is the submittal, uh, just the top portion of the submittal. And you can see um, on the right hand side, I just have to move my video, I apologize. On the right hand side, you can see we actually list the ECM motor amperage. We also give you airflow on low, medium and high with a dry coil and a wet coil. And then of course your external static pressure. Now, the reason I'm doing low static air handlers first is because there's some rules of duct design that we have to actually uh, break when it comes to low static air handlers. And there's more maximum parameters we have to put around it. So I'm gonna talk about the most restrictive design first and then loosen things up when it comes to higher static air handlers or mid static air handlers. So the first one here, Thing I want to point out, we always in the Northeast, we design around a wet coil. That's because in the summertime, we're actually going to be removing moisture. So our wet coil typically has lower volume of air because the air has to move through the coil plus the water, right? If we were in Arizona or a very dry climate, we would design around a dry coil because we're not going to be removing moisture. Also, it's really important to note that all of the low static air handlers for Mitsubishi ship at a medium speed of a static pressure of 0.14, all right, which is very low. It's probably not enough static pressure to even handle any air filter you attach to the system. So when we design with an SEZ, our low static air handlers, we actually designed around max static. It's the only way we're gonna be able to connect ductwork to the system. Now, when we get to mid static, obviously we would never typically design around a maximum because there's no way to turn the airflow up or down. So it's really bad right, uh, for, for technicians to make adjustments. Um, great question, Steve. It says, why is there three airflows, but yet four static pressures? So we will actually limit the volume of air and the static pressure with that ECM motor. So um, it's not like a PSC motor where we have four speeds and the static pressure will reduce the volume of air. The only time we will reduce the volume of air if we get above that maximum static because it's an ECM motor. All right. Hopefully that answers your question. Ideally, we'd love to have infinite choices, right? But we can't. We have to pick a few. All right. So this is a submittal for the SEZ one ton system. So I'm just going to continue on here just to give you an idea of how we come up with available static pressure. So remember, this is the only system we're going to design around high static high static setting, the highest, which is not high static, right? 0 0.20. So we start with 0 0.20, but let's say I want to add a nice MERV-8, four or five inch pleated air filter. When I put that larger pleated air filter on that system, we have pressure drop and we have to deduct for that pressure drop. So we started at 349 CFM on high with a wet coil at 0 0.20, but we deduct 0 0.08, let's say, for that particular air filter. Also, we need to deduct for one supply register, one return grill, and if you have a balancing damper, then you would deduct for that too. And this is just a standard of 0 0.03 each out of manual D. It's a standard amount. If you use a normal, let's say, Hart and Cooley register, 
Um, not the Regio register, crazy ornamental wooden ones. Obviously, that's a more restriction, all right? But if you're using something standard, you can just uh, adjust for one supply register and a return grill. Now, you'll notice I slashed balancing damper. When you design a low static air handler, we're not going to have enough static pressure, most likely, to handle even just an additional balancing damper when it comes to that system if we're adding a, a MERV-8 media filter. So if we don't add a good filter, then we, can add, then we can handle that pressure drop of a balancing damper. So typically the rule becomes with low static air handlers, we don't install balancing dampers, but that's because there's so little ductwork going to the system that you probably don't even need it because it goes to one or two rooms anyway, okay? Um, that's the only reason. It's really around this. Now, when you do this math, you need to have at least 0 0.06 available or above to make this system work just on the top portion of the uh, of the friction rate uh, uh, math, right? So just on this uh, step one through three on your friction rate worksheet. If you don't have at least 0 0.06, then you need to either increase your available static pressure. So go from 0.14 to 0.2 or reduce how many components you're adding to the system. All right, otherwise you won't have enough static pressure to overcome that when things start to get dirty. All right. Um, what's the static pressure? This looks like somebody's asking what the static uh, pressure drop is on an AirTech ceiling diffuser. Believe it or not, um, that just saves you the uh, the equivalent length. We haven't got to equivalent length yet of the boot because the AirTech is all one piece and you just put a 90 on the top, right? So um, typically those are somewhere around 0 0.03, 0 0.02, um, but it saves you the equivalent length value when we get to that portion on the bottom side of the equation, all right? All right, so moving on to the bottom side. Total equivalent length of the longest duct run. And this uh, typically is found on the back side of a lot of duct calculators, right? So there's a lot of fitting values. If you ever work with the actual manual D, it's probably 300 pages and at least two thirds of it is just pictures of fittings in order to explain what the equivalent length value is. Now, equivalent length value is based on pressure drop for that particular fitting. So the lower the equivalent length value, that means the easier it is for the air to move through that fit. So as an example here, if you just have a, uh, a box, like a picture on the left-hand side on our low static air handlers, this is the most popular way to duct one of our low static air handlers, keeping the air straight with very little pressure loss and no balancing dampers, all right? This is not what you would normally do with mid static or high static air handlers. I wanna make sure I'm clear on this. I've said it like three or four times. I know I'm beating that horse, but I need to make sure you don't do this design on these other style, only on low static. So if you look at that box, there's a box that's typically eight to 10 inches in depth off of the front of an air handler, the low static SEZs. And then they're taking those takeoffs right off the end of the box. Now, when we do this equivalent length value math, we're only doing the longest run. So on the supply side in this example, that first fitting off the end of the box is 35 feet. And you would see that on your duct calculator on the back, typically on the top left, shows you plenum fittings. And the, you're going to look for the ones that are straight or tapered and get the value off of that. All right. So even though it's only six inches in actual feet, right? It's actually a 35 foot fitting because the air has to make this pressurized turn or reduction. And then in this example, I had 10 feet of round branch duct. And in that branch duct was two long sweep 90s. And they're 10 feet um, each, right? For those long sweep 90s. I apologize, five feet each for long sweep 90s times two is 10 in this example. And then uh, because I have an air tech, uh, diffuser, like somebody asked about, there was no additional feet on the supply for that boot. But if you're going to go into a floor or a ceiling and you have a register boot, you need to actually account for that boot as well. And those can range anywhere from five if they're straight to as high as 50 if it's a right angle boot that goes into a floor. So it's really important to use low value fittings here. Make it very easy for the air to make the turn because we're not gonna have a lot of pressure to overcome bad fittings, like bullhead tees or um, floor registers, right? If you're able to do this in a ceiling, it's a lot easier with those one piece register kits, okay? 
course, you do need a return duct. There's not a good picture here on the left. Um, if we were in, uh, let's say, an attic and we had a central return, we might have 10 feet for that box and then five feet of actual return duct going into the ceiling. So this is just a central return in a hallway. All right. Um, when you add up all of these values, it ends up being 70 equivalent feet. And when you do this with a low static air handler, you want to be sure that this value is below 100. If it's above 100, we're going to actually do the math and it'll reduce the values uh, of the friction rate even further from what we have for available static. So these were the pictures I was telling you about. Actually, I probably should have brought this up earlier. I apologize. But on the back of duct calculators, these are those fitting values I was referring to. All right. So when we do this um, layout, it's really important for the air to make smooth transitions. If you're going to run a round trunk, as an example here, um, a lot of our distributors uh, for Mitsubishi work with Duck Pack out of Massachusetts. And you can see they make a standard um 10 or 12 inch uh starting collar for these sez air handlers to go to round trunk so that way it's a long throat and they have a really low value uh if you were just to put a box and you were still going to try to run a trunk off of that and take anything off the side those fitting values become very high when you do this um, don't ever do what you see in the top right which is a gr a great animated video that mitsubishi put out on our youtube channel but you can see the picture, it shows a bullhead T. If you did this with an SEZ air handler, you would never get air past that T because the pressure drop of that bullhead T is um, one point, oh, sorry, 0 0.12 inches, which is 120 feet. Uh, it would just kill the airflow. Now you could do that with uh, mid or high static air handlers. All right. So there is some standard sizes and uh, the, this particular duct manufacturer did this to make it easy for distributors to stock. Some distributors actually make their own transitions. Keep in mind, these are very odd size uh, boxes that come off the front. As an example, it's probably like seven and a quarter by 20 something wide. Um, if you go to something normal like round trunk, just make sure you take the takeoffs at an angle off the side to keep the lowest values. Andy mentioned uh, with no dampers, how do you balance? Yeah, it's going to be really important with low static air handlers that we keep the zones very small, it's one or two rooms, and you shouldn't need balancing if you size the system correctly, okay? When you're doing an entire floor, balancing is very important and you shouldn't be using a low static air handler. We're gonna to get to that particular thing as an example as we go to the mid and high static, okay? All right, um, so the math on this particular low static air handler works out like this. Your friction loss per 100 feet, we just plug in these two numbers. If you remember, there's 0.06 available, times the constant of 100 divided by 70 feet in that example. So you see it's very small amount of duct work and equivalent length. And you'll notice the design friction loss works out to 0 0.08. We need to make sure design friction loss stays between 0 0.06 and 0.16. And if you remember, that was that chart on the friction rate worksheet that we sent out. Um, it tells you if it's too low, then you need to increase blower speed, which is really hard to do with a low static air handler or use a different system, larger, a larger blower, or reduce your equivalent length value to get the friction loss back up, all right? If it's too high, then you need to decrease the blower speed, use a lower static. And we see this a lot actually with ducted heat pumps. And I'll show you that uh, when we get to the, the higher static air handles because everything's part of the system shipped with the blower. So we tend to have more static to go around than we need, all right? Or increase the TEL, maybe use a couple bad fittings to slow the airflow down. Otherwise it becomes noisy. OK, so they give you the guidance right on there. If it's between 0.06 and 0.16, believe it or not, unfortunately, right in the middle is that rule of thumb that everybody uses, which we don't want anyone using anymore um, at 0.1 rule of thumb. The closer to 0.1, the actual system design, the better, because we have room to go up and down when it comes to static pressure losses or poor duct design. We can turn the fan up in order to overcome that sometimes. Thank you. Chris, did you um, see these other two questions? I apologize. It might have come in as I was talking. So uh, fan coil unit, then an air handling unit. Am I wrong? Okay, so yeah, the look of the SEZ looks like a fan coil, uh, but it's actually uh, an air handler in the fact that it's a refrigerant coil that goes into it. Um, it's just a low profile uh, sus ceiling suspended or in a ceiling um, style air handler. 
And then this next one, um, with no dampers, how do you balance? Yeah, I did address that, but you okay, wouldn't okay. put dampers in when you're only handling one or two rooms here. As long as the design is correct, you're going to have the right airflow out. When we do a whole entire floor, obviously we need a higher static air handler in order to then put dampers in and overcome those restrictions. So that's when balancing is really important when you're doing like three or more rooms, right? Thanks, Chris. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for bringing that up. I apologize for missing those. All right. So we're going to size these duck runs using the worksheet. So I'm going to walk through this example first um, and then make sure everybody's clear on the process because obviously we're just doing one or two rooms here. And then we're going to do a whole floor with a mid or high static air handler. So in order to do the worksheet on the back, uh, the second page, right, we need to calculate our heating and cooling factors. I'm going to walk you through this example and how to do this. And then we're going to multiply these factors by the room sensible loads. All right. So that's why in order to do a new duct system, we actually have to have a room by room load calc because we need the sensible loads for each room to know how much volume of air goes to each room. That's how we size the runs. Uh, the design CFM is going to be the higher the two values. Just because a heat pump runs typically at the same volume of air does not always mean we design around cooling or heating. And just because you need more total volume of air on, let's say, a furnace with an AC or heat pump add-on doesn't mean we always design around the, the, the cooling CFM, right? When you do the runs first, you're going to find sometimes it's around heating needs for the room. Sometimes it's around cooling needs for the room. And that's why we put balancing dampers in, right? And then, of course, we're going to use the design friction rate, then that calculated design CFM to actually size those duct runs, okay? So this is what the worksheet looks like on the top side. This is how we calculate the heating and cooling factors. We need to know the blower CFM in heating divided by the manual J total heat loss for that area or room, right? So with a low static air handler, this would be one or two rooms. Of course, if you're doing a whole floor, it would be the manual J heat loss for that whole floor in order to then you know, associate the correct volume of air to each room. Now cooling, this is really important. You need to take the blower CFM in cooling, but divide it by only the manual J sensible heat gain, not your total heat gain. And this is because all of your latent heat is removed at the coil. That's the moisture in the air, right? Only the, the air that's going to the room is only going to change the sensible temperature. We need to get the air back to remove the moisture. So your duct design and the volume of air is based on the sensible heat gain. Okay. So this is where people start to make some mistakes. Really important. You remove the latent. And that's why most manual J software reports separate latent and sensible. And then, of course, you add the two together and that's your total. Right. So in this particular example, we'll get that 349 CFM that I had on that first page from the submittal for the SEZ one ton. That's the top side of the equation for heating and cooling, right? Because it's the same volume of air. Then, of course, we're going to divide that by the heat loss for those zone or room. In this example, it was only 12,400. That would come off of my manual J report. And you only want to go three decimal points. Anything past three decimal points will not change the duct run size. So in this example, the heating factor when you do that math is 0 0.028. Of course, you do the same thing with just the sensible gain in cooling. Volume of air divided by, in this example, 9,059 gives me 0 0.039 as the cooling factor. All right, so those are the two numbers we're gonna transfer over to the duct sizing worksheet. And in this example, because we're not in person and we can't walk through and I can't have you do this um, with me helping you at each and every person. I just color coded this to make sure you see where the math goes. So heating is going to be in red. Cooling is going to be in blue. And then of course your design numbers are going to be in green. Okay. So you can see we transferred over the 0.028 in heating, the 0.039 in cooling for cooling factor. And then of course the calculated friction rate we came up with on the other page of 0 0.08. That's what we're going to set our duct calculator for to size the runs. Then we're just going to list the rooms that we're going to service with this air handler. So this particular unit is going to service a master bedroom, a bathroom, and then a second bedroom. So probably, let's say, upstairs of a Cape style home. Okay. If we have an attic above it, maybe we duct to that particular beca uh, area because the loads are so low in this example. So we would list the heat loss for each room. So as an example, the master bedroom heat loss was 7,200, right? And then we list the sensible heat gain for each room. 
So in that example for the master bedroom, it was 4,200. And then it's simple math. And I say simple, but I need to use a calculator unless we're calculating commission. Uh, that I can do in my head typically. But when it comes to sizing runs, I got to use a calculator. Um, but as an example here, we would multiply 7,200 for the master bedroom and heating times 0 0.028 for the heating factor to come up with heating CFM. In this example, it was 201, 201. Now, the way duct design and layout works, it's recommended 200 CFM or more, you split those runs into two because you have a big area and you wanna spread that air around for that particular space. Um, for this example, I'm just gonna keep it simple and keep it as one run. Um, but if I was doing this for a house in actual design, I might split this up into two 100 CFM runs in that example. Of course, we're gonna figure out if we're gonna design around heating first. Uh, we're gonna do cooling BTUs for the master bedroom, the 4,200 times 0 0.039 for the cooling factor gives me 164 CFM. So in this example, we have a higher heat loss for the master bedroom in volume of air that's needed compared to the sensible heat gain. So we don't always design around the cooling needs, right? So our design CFM is gonna be the larger of the two, the 201. Everybody good so far? Ah, so a question came in. Why are we ignoring latent dehumidification? We're not ignoring it. We're handling it at the coil. That's why we have return ducts. We need to remove the moisture at the coil. Um, the latent demand in the space is still there, but if we don't get the air back, we can't remove the moisture because it doesn't come across that cold coil. Only sensible temperature is changed when it comes to airflow. So um, airflow is actually gonna change the sensible temperature, the number you see on the thermostat, right? All the dehumidification is taken out when the air gets back across that cold coil. Now, if we're doing ductless, obviously this process wouldn't apply, but you would probably just actually look at your, your total in order to accommodate that because it's within the space, right? All right, hopefully that answers your question, Steve. All right, so let's move along. Um, we would do the same for the rest of the rooms, right? Now there's two style duct calculators. If anybody has one, you can follow along. Um, you don't have to, I'm just gonna show you some examples. Um, round duct calculators, pretty simple. There's some key pieces of info you need to look at in order to size runs. And then I'm gonna show you velocity, which is the most ignored portion of a duct calculator that it's really important when it comes to noise and comfort. So your friction rate, which we calculated in this example at 0 0.08, you tend to line up with the volume of air that you need, CFM. Uh, that can be in a window or in this example on this older style, you just line it up because it's printed on the back piece. Once you line that up, you're going to get your round size duct diameter in that, that uh, first arrow. And then, of course, your rectangular duct diameter, if you're doing typically trunk duct uh, on the bottom in green in this example. And then the red side is velocity. We need to verify it fits within the minimum and maximum recommended. So it's actually going to mix the air in the room and it's not gonna to be too noisy. On a slide rule style, this is, the, this is the one I personally prefer, and this is the one that Mitsubishi tends to print. Um, if you're interested in these, obviously we plan on having some of these. I believe we're exhibiting at a better, better building uh, design. Um, I'm sure Joe and Mike will have some of these for you. We just got a bunch printed. Uh, definitely stop by and grab one from them. Same information on here. You can see friction rate is printed on the top. We would line that up with the volume of air in the window. And then of course, it'll tell you round duct diameter for A in that A arrow in the middle, rectangular duct diameter on the right-hand side. And then of course we can verify velocity on the bottom side of that window. So all the same information, just in a different format. So we would walk through the same for the bathroom, right? We would do the multiplication. Um, I personally like to figure out all the design CFM and then run through size, but in this example, if we were going to line up 0 0.08 of for friction rate to the volume of air we need, 201, you're going to find that it falls in, and I just want to say the right thing, so I'm just going to do it myself. It falls just in between seven and eight regarding the round size. Now, the question always becomes, do we use seven or do we use eight? And that's where velocity comes in. So velocity will tell you, do you use seven or do you use eight, okay? You don't always go bigger because sometimes the air now is gonna move so slow, it barely blows into the room and it doesn't hit your design. It doesn't mix the room and we have hot and cold spots within that space. 
So there's poor stratification in that example. All right, um, so same, same with the design multiplication for the bathroom. We do heat, heat loss by heating factor, cooling gains by cooling factor. The higher the two is design. In this example, 80 CFM at 0 0.08, you'll see it falls uh, just in between closer to six. So I'll put six for this example. And then of course your second bedroom needs another six based on 109 CFM. Now is when we move to velocity and verifying that those are the right sizes. So we need three runs in this example. Um, and I'm just gonna ask a rhetorical question because we're not in person, but I want you to think which hose here has more volume of water? I'll give you a second to think about it. Uh, and then I'm gonna let you know it's a trick question because you don't know how big it is, right? How big the, the piece is. And you can't see, you can't just put your hand in front of running water and know the volume of air. You might be able to be, tell how much, which one has more velocity because you can see how far it's blasting or how, how, how much air, let's say with a duct system is hitting your hand when it comes to velocity, how fast it's hitting your hand, but you can't measure volume that way. It's quite possible that the hose on the left-hand side is moving more volume of water, more gallons per minute. It's just moving it slower, right? And that's what I want you to think about when it comes to airflow here. So if the hose on the right is, um, you're trying to water something that's very delicate, it's gonna ruin it, right? It's gonna be really fast and noisy and, and ruin whatever you're trying to water. So the same principle applies to air, okay? There's a minimum velocity that we wanna stay above, and there's a maximum of velocity that we want velocity that we want to stay below. Oh, that's a mouthful. I apologize. Um, you can see that this is actually on every duct calculator. If you're using the slide rule, it's actually on the back side of the slide rule. You slide it up, and all that information's right in there. And you can see this chart tells you for trunk and branch ducts, if you have on the supply somewhere between six to nine hundred feet per minute is fine. Anything over 900 feet per minute is going to be too noisy and you want to make your duct larger to slow the air down. Anything below 600, you want to make the duct smaller to speed the air back up. And then, of course, we want it a little bit quieter on the return because filters start to get dirty, ECM motors start to ramp up, and it's really easy for us to go past design, right? So we slow the air down a little bit more in the return. And that's typically five to 700 feet per minute when we're sizing returns. Okay, so those are the mins and maxes that you want to abide by. So when we kick back to that worksheet, what we're going to do is we're going to line up the duct calculator directly to the first round size. In this example, it's eight inches. And that eight inch round duct, when we look at volume of air of 201, you can see it falls right at about 590 feet per minute. Now, if you remember on the previous screen, I'm just gonna kick back a screen here. The minimum on a supply should be 600. So unless this is a really short run, we don't wanna stick with an eight inch. We wanna make sure we downsize to seven inch and we still wanna verify a seven inch is not gonna to be too fast now. So we would go to seven inch on our duct calculator, look in the window at 200 feet per minute and see that it's just about 750 feet per minute, which is right in the middle and perfect for design. So we would continue on with a seven inch for that master bedroom in that example, right? Keep in mind though, we would probably split that into two in realistic. This is just a classroom example. Then we would do the same for the others, right? Uh, we wanna make sure that the air is not moving too slow or too fast. You can see in this example, the six inch ends up being really low, 410 feet per minute. So we actually have to downsize that to a five for the bathroom. And then um, the, the be second bedroom, we could downsize, but we shouldn't because if we go to six, I'm sorry, we go to five inches and we're putting 109 CFM through that, unfortunately, the feet per minute is too high. It's over 900. So we stick to the lower number in that example because we don't want a noisy second bedroom when that thing cranks up. So that is how you size the runs. Now, of course, with low static air handlers, we don't necessarily have to worry about sizing the trunk in this example. But if we're gonna run a large round trunk, we wanna size that trunk based on the total design CFM, not the 349 that we actually are running at. We wanna design it around, please forgive me, looks like 390, okay? When you add up the green design CFM values. 
So pretty cut and dry. Um, Steve asked, he says that he has an honest question here. Uh, why not size directly to feet per minute instead of doing the friction rate method and then changing it for feet per minute? Well, that's because you're going to have a tough time accounting for all your pressure drops, right? So um, if you size only for velocity and you don't account for pressure drop in the friction rate piece, it's just assuming that all your friction rates are fine, right? So in this example, I could do this by velocity only, but then find out, oh my gosh, I have so many pressure drops that the system doesn't work. I need to have something available to overcome, right? Um, So Lee asked about face velocity. So that must be on the previous screen. Hold on one second. So face velocity is gonna be at the register. So typically you size your outlet registers. This is actually manual T. When you select registers, your maximum face velocity should be 700 feet per minute on the supply. That gives you typically on the correctly sized register a 0 0.03 pressure drop. And anything less than that won't be noisy. So it's the, it's the measurement of the air at the, at the register, at the face. And the same thing at a filter grill face velocity. Now, to Steve's point, I have gotten away with sizing filter grills based on face velocity almost across the board. It's really easy to do that because the pressure loss is very little in a return. There's no dampers. You just have that one register, all right? Karen asked me to just repeat why there's a minimum feet per minute. And why is that a problem to oversize ductwork? Ah, great question. Everybody thinks bigger is better with ductwork. Unfortunately, we're designing around your highest speed in this example. So if you can imagine, if we didn't have a minimum, what happens to the airflow when we actually turn the speed down, right? When that speed turns down because the demand turns down with a variable speed heat pump or furnace or anything really, um, air conditioner, then the feet per minute slow down. And you and like Steve said, stratification in the room, you're not gonna be able to blow the air across that entire wall or floor, right? And it'll only, instead of throwing, let's say eight feet to a ceiling from a floor register, it might only throw four feet. And we can't mix the air in the room and you have uncomfortable spaces. And we also can't get that latent heat back to the return by not mixing the air in the space. So it's really important when you select registers, if you're not familiar, um, definitely get a copy of Manual T. Um, it's, it's duct layout, and it'll help you decide on um, throw. So what you'll find is a lot of people, instead of, let's say, putting a register or in a, in a, I'm sorry, a supply register by a window in order to sweep the window because you have to throw so far, they might put a central register that blows four ways and you only have to blow half as half the distance, right? Um, Andy asked, and, and, and Andy, I, ha I happen to, to know you, uh, been a long time. Um, how does rule of thumb for velocity change in a super insulated or passive house with very low heat losses? Uh, the design changes, but your velocity doesn't change, right? So you, you still don't want a noisy duct system. What's gonna end up happening is, is hopefully that system is gonna run at partial load much more often. So it's gonna ramp down. And what I find a lot of people do is in a low load home, they tend to mix the air using ventilation in order to keep that air moving. Um, there's some ways of keeping those rooms comfortable outside of just fix, fixing an airspeed on high with our ducted systems. That you wanna avoid because then we can't get that moisture to actually drain off the coil. So the rule of thumb or the mins and maxes don't change for design when it comes to velocity. What changes is the volume of air that you're gonna be needing because the system's gonna be smaller, all right? And what ends up happening is the lower the volume of air and the lower the static pressure, the more obvious duct design issues become because you don't have the pressure or the volume of air to overcome that, right? So these still apply. Um, the lower the static, the more obvious and the, and the more detrimental a mistake becomes. Right. Um, let me just get back to where I was. Um, so this is a copy of Manual T you can see on this. So it's almost like I knew Lee was gonna ask that, right? Um, so this is a step-by-step -step on how to select, size, locate supply diffusers, grills and registers, right? Where to put return grills. Um, it's a pretty short read, might be a hundred pages. It's an actual manual. Um, and not to, not to make anybody uncomfortable, but the way the process usually works, remember I talked about J, S, and D, it actually goes J, it's an easy way to remember, J, S, T, D, right? 
So um, it's an easy way to remember the design process, JSTD, when it comes to uh, designing a ducted system. All right. So this is the point I'm going to take a, a pause and give you guys an opportunity. Uh, make sure you move your, your video if you can't get the whole QR code on your screen. But if you want a 29 page document that I wrote years ago on designing low static air handlers, it's free. You just need your email so that way you can get the link. Um, if you use the QR code on the screen, it's from my blog. So this is not a Mitsubishi uh, presentation to start. I adapted this presentation, this design uh, manual D presentation for Mitsubishi products. I also run HVAC Pro blog outside of work. You might see my face there. Um, I have a great YouTube channel. I'll give you the details on that at the end of the class. But because this provides an opportunity to answer any more questions on low static before we move on to uh, a little bit more normal design and normal duct design rules, I wanted to give you guys a chance to get this. So I'm just going to give you one minute if you want to scan that QR code. I tested it, it should work. If anybody has any issues getting it, you can always go to hvacproblog.com and my contact page is on there too. Um, you can definitely get a hold of me that way. So before I move on, any further questions on low static air handlers? So Steve says, I noticed Energy Plus is not one of the softwares listed, but it isn't that the backbone of HAP and Trace? It's possible. So um, please forgive me. I am not a raider. Um, maybe uh, Bryn might be able to chime in on this, uh, but I believe that's an energy rating software, right? For hers raiders. And even though it's not approved, you probably are getting close to the, the building loads. Um, and obviously building loads are used to, to then calculate usage, right? So um, ah, HAP is carrier load and energy modeling. Okay. So yeah, HAP and Trace, uh, they could, if they include everything for Manual J version eight, could get their software approved by reaching out to ACA. If they haven't, it doesn't mean it's not completely accurate. It just means it's not approved and you can't use it for code purposes. Um, it's quite possible commercially, it, 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 it works out just great. It might not be just Manual J, right, for residential. I have a feeling that's probably the case. Maybe they don't include all of the the duct gains and losses or all of the different nuances for residential compared to commercial. Ah, yeah, so Steve said it is commercial tools. That makes sense. Um, it might be approved for commercial design for manual N. I don't know that offhand. All right, so I'm gonna move along here. So if you didn't get a chance to get that, just reach out to me through the website or, or even um, Mike or Joe can get a hold of me at any time. All right, so the next one I just want to talk about, a lot of the same rules apply on layout when it comes to a PEAD, which is our, what is quote unquote, mid-static air handler. So the mid-static air handlers actually ship at 0 0.40 inches of water column to start your external static pressure. And this is the, the submittal taken right off of mylinkdrive.com. And you can see the volume of air that is associated with those external static pressures. So you can see there's three choices when it comes to volume of air. Um, and then there's five choices when it comes to maximum static. So what you want to do with mid and high static heat pumps or furnaces or any other ducted system is you want to choose a mid static rate and medium speed, because this gives your technicians the opportunity to fix a system after the fact, turn the speed up or down, change the static pressure setting up or down. If you design around a maximum, it's really hard for a technician. So this is why the design for mid and high static is different compared to low static because there's just not enough static pressure to go around a medium static and a medium fan on low static air handlers. High static, we can abide by those duct design rules. So in this example here, we're gonna use 671 CFM at 0.4 and we would walk through the exact same process we just did. Or if we're using a high static air handler, it would be even higher choice. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you that in a second. Um, so you can see here, right off the submittal, 0 0.40 is a medium or medium high static, 671 with a wet coil on medium speed. That's what we would use for this particular two and a half ton PEAD air handler. And as far as the duct layout, there are a couple choices here. A lot of people like to use uh, a rectangle to round transition and run round duct because it's a little easier and um, it's a little more readily available. If you're making your own trunk or you have a, a distributor that actually manufactures it, sorry, <coughs> you 
you can get that seven and a quarter or eight and a quarter no, weird size that Mitsubishi has or any other manufacturer of heat pumps make um, and keep that size trunk if you wanted to. Um, these are a couple of uh, projects that were in New York that uh, I believe came out, I would say pretty. I'm, not, I, I'm one of those people that see a mechanical system and um, my family hates when I point out the, all the good things at the restaurant or whatever that they did. Typically it's the bad things, so let's be honest. Um, in this example, these were great designs. We talk about internal radiuses to keep the, uh, the equivalent length low, long sweep 90s, not using a bullhead T in that top example, but instead using what we affectionately call a pair of pants, a Y, right? So, um, a lot of great duct design things that happen to make these systems work correctly at a much lower static and lower volume of air so it's not noisy all right um, we also make standard air handlers that we would consider high static but this is normal duct design this goes up to eight tenths of an inch right and you can see the maximum airflow on a three ton air handler for mitsubishi is just 910 cfm so what ends up happening is you're going to move the same volume of air or remove the same I'm sorry, you're going to remove the same uh, amount of BTUs or move the same amount of BTUs with less volume of air compared to a unitary style product, right? So if you're familiar with, um, I, there was some great examples, Train and American Standard, uh, like Steve mentioned, they're typically 350 to 400 CFM per ton. Mitsubishi is normally closer to 3 to 320 CFM per ton. Um, and that allows you to use typically smaller ductwork or a bigger system in smaller existing ductwork. Not drastic, but half a ton can easily be overcome by putting in a system that runs lower volume of air with higher heat output. All right. So same with design principles here. The medium speed with a medium static pressure is what we would design around. So in this example, we would choose 910 CFM and half an inch of static, 0.5, because that's medium. And it gives our technicians the ability to turn it up or turn it down if it's too noisy or it can't be balanced or the design of the ductwork couldn't be perfect when you actually applied it to the house when it goes to be installed, right? Maybe somebody had to use a different transition or they used a top takeoff instead of a side takeoff. And next thing you know, you can't get the air there. That would give the technician the ability to make that adjustment, all right? If you haven't realized, I used to be a service manager and a service tech at one time. So um, big on making sure things have the ability of, 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 of being adjusted in the field. All right, so in this example, I chose that 910 CFM and half an inch of static. And then we do the exact same process, but we're obviously gonna be servicing a whole floor with this size air handler or this size system. So we start with uh, the available blower static and we deduct the devices we're adding to the unit in the longest run. So a MERV-8 media filter. And that same MERV-8, it might be 16 by 25, four or five inch pleated, right? Or 20 by 25, right? Those are large filters. Um, when you put more volume of air through the same size filter, you get a higher pressure loss. So if you remember, the same filter I used with the lower static air handler only had a 0 0.08 pressure loss. Of course, uh, Andy, great question. We always design around a clean filter. Um, we don't design around a filter that's partly loaded. Um, the ECM motor should be able to, we design around a medium static, should be able to ramp up and overcome a partly loaded filter. All right, great question though. All right, um, so we have a 0.15 pressure loss because we're moving more air through the same size filter compared to the lower volume of air through the same size filter on a lower static. So 0.15 minus from what we started with, 0 0.50. And then of course, one supply register, one return grill and a balancing damper. So 0.03 a piece, remember this is not a stock list, it's just the longest run. We deduct that from what we started with. And now we end up with 0.26 for the top side of the equation. So Steve asks, so the ECM process variable is pressure, not flow. Um, no, uh, just to be sure, Steve, what, what I'm trying, uh, yes, so ECMs can control based on volume of air, but they have a maximum static pressure setting. They can't overcome above. If you didn't control maximum static, the motor would continue to ramp up on a poorly designed system and the control board of the motor would fail. So most ECM motors in the last 15 years have a maximum external static pressure as well. Just so you know, if you're designing around an ECM motor, let's say in a furnace or a heat pump or anything, and you have to turn it up past medium, don't go above 0.7. Anything above 0.7, typically you're going to use more electricity than you would with a PSC motor, um, and it's going to be very noisy. 
Um, so he says he does a lot of ECM heat pumps, but he doesn't have experience with the fans. Yeah. Don't, don't design around 0.7 with an ECM. And this was, if you remember, um, 15, 20 years ago, uh, this was like the savior for poor duck work, right? They're like, don't worry about it. We can just put an ECM motor. And then they started failing and people were wondering why. <laughs> um, so really important design. You have to make sure it's going to work in that. Um, yeah, Andy, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking. What's the algorithm for an ECM variable speed? Um, are you talking about the association between static pressure and volume of air? If that's the case, the, the curve is pretty flat when it's uh, at normal static. Once you get above, yeah, what causes the ECM to vary the speed? I got you. So um, in that example, the ECM uh, is varying speed based on demand, right? So in Mitsubishi air handlers, the demand is based on your return air. The um, There's like six or seven sensors in the indoor and outdoor unit. And it's going to tell the compressor to ramp up or ramp down. And the target coil temperature will tell the fan to ramp up or ramp down in heating and cooling. So um, of course, there's going to be a maximum, which is maximum volume of, of refrigerant and maximum volume of air, right? Hopefully that answered your question. Awesome. Yeah, it is a little complex, I know. I was trying to keep it designed, not uh, technical, not too too technical. Um, but we're not designing around all of these variables. We're designing around what high is, right? What we're setting that maximum speed at, and what the design static pressure is. That's what we design around. We can't design around every other opportunity. All right. All right. Um, so back to the presentation here. We started with 0.5. We deduct those devices. We end up with 0.26. Now, obviously the design of the duct layout for a mid static or high stack, because we're servicing a whole floor, it's gonna be much more complex. This is actually a great picture out of the old manual D that has every style and name of fitting that is available to residential HVAC contractors. Now me personally, when I was 16 and I was at a, 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 a distributor picking up what I had no idea uh, flat elbow was, um, it was much easier to order, like when you're ordering um, food in a foreign country, you can point to the number or know the number. It was much easier for me to get the right part. And that's what a lot of technicians use this for. So that way when they're making uh, runs or you're, you're designing a system, you know which fitting it's supposed to be. That way what you design and what is actually installed or picked up is the same fitting, right? Um, each one of these fittings have a different equivalent length value. And remember, just because it's the furthest away on the supply does not make the longest run. The longest run is in equivalent length values. Sometimes in this example, you can see the second longest might have, it says a stack head, but that stack might go up to the second or third floor. And that is further away and more equivalent length with all of the turns, okay? So typically you're looking at the one or two furthest away or three furthest away to determine which one has the worst fittings to know which one's the longest run, all right? Um, and always a top takeoff is a much higher value than a side takeoff. Um, it's usually 40 or 50 feet for a top takeoff and the max on a side takeoff is 35 feet. So usually any side takeoffs that are further away is your longest run. Um, someone asked, Steve asked, is it recommended to always have that dead head end cap like that? Absolutely. So that's a rule of duct design. I'm going to cover the 10 rules of duct design right after I get through this example. Um, you don't, you, you actually have to have that static pressure built up in the trunk for the air to make the turn. And you need to not be within a foot of that end cap. So yeah, we're going to walk through those because what ends up happening, I find is when a system's not operating correctly, a lot of times it's duct design and you need to figure out what item to fix. And I would say that's the first item to look for because if you take anything off that end cap, not like a low static, but on a mid or high static, it depressurizes the whole trunk and all the air goes to that one run. All right. Um, so we'll get to that though. All right. So um, where the air enters the furthest return to where it exits the furthest supply and equivalent length value is going to be our longest run. A lot more complex when you're doing a whole floor. So in this example, you can see this is a vertical system, probably the first floor, let's say of a colonial or a cape, it's in the basement. And we're going to calculate just a central return in the middle of the hallway and the furthest supply, which looks like um, it's probably gonna be the stack head down there. Now, when we do this, I just wanna explain some of the fittings and what to look for, especially on replacements, okay? So 
uh, this is the top plenum coming off of the top of a vertical system. Even if you flip this horizontally, the same numbers apply, okay? So if you pressurize that box and you just come with a 1A fitting off the side of that box for the trunk, right stabbing into the side of it, then that's a 35 foot fitting. Believe it or not, that's not bad, okay? Because you're able to pressurize the box and the air can now make that turn. If you make it easier for the air to make the turn, just by having a tapered fitting for the air to make that turn, instead of 35 feet, it could be 10 feet. That's a much lower value. That's only a pressure loss of 0.01. If you guys didn't know, you can accurately express equivalent length with pressure loss just by moving the decimal points. There's a 0.1 pressure loss for every 100 foot fitting. So if you have a 120 foot fitting, which is a bullhead T, then that would be a 0.12 pressure loss like we talked about earlier, okay? Same thing applies on the bottom here when you talk about a smooth 90 compared to a four or five piece or a three piece, you can see as we make it harder for the air to make the turn, the equivalent length value goes up. And it all depends on the mitered turn, the radius, right? That's what determines the equivalent length value. So when it's smooth and a long radius, we could have as small as a 10 foot fitting. Um, but typically we're working with 30 or 35 foot 90s because that's what people buy, it's the cheapest and that's what distributors stuck. So if we're talking about low static air handlers, we wanna use smooth, long sweep 90s. We're talking about high static handlers, they can overcome that. You can use those, okay? Um, and you can see 45s, so they're not just in half because it depends on how many pieces there is, right? So um, a three piece 45 is only 10 feet. A two piece 45, because it's a harder angle, is gonna be 15 feet, all right? So really important. Now, another uh, uh, typical, fitting that we usually see on vertical systems, and I, this happens to be a furnace, uh, but you can see is a right angle return drop. So that right angle return drop, if it's a hard 90 on the inside radius there, that's actually a 65 foot fitting. But if you have a mitered inside turn and it's a long sweep on the inside, you could reduce that to as low as 30 feet, more than half. So it's easier for the air to make that turn. It's less noisy lower static pressures, right? And um, lower equivalent length value. So you could use smaller duct work in that example. Um, so if it's easier for the air to make the turn, it's much better for the system when it comes to the health of the system and how noisy it's gonna be and how much electricity it's gonna use. So in this example, you can see, I'm gonna keep these numbers really small and just kind of walk you through. If you can imagine the basement duct layout of, of a, a vertical air handler, and we had a, a box coming off the top of it. And that first plenum starting collar going into a trunk is the first fitting we account for on the supply. And if it's got an internal mitered on the inside radius of any sort, then it's gonna be a 10 foot plenum starting collar, a very low pressure loss to get the air into that trunk. And in this example, we had 20 feet of trunk duct. And in that trunk duct, we actually can't run just the same size trunk. We have to reduce the trunk size in order to keep the velocity up, right? So typically every two to three takeoffs, and that's another rule of duct design, we end up downsizing the trunk in order to get the velocity back up above 700 feet per minute, right? Every time we downsize the trunk on the back of your duct calculator and the extended plenum fitting section, you'll see a, down, a, 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 a trunk reducer. It's five feet for each transition down. There's a little bit of restriction there to get the velocity back up. If we had two transitions in that trunk, then we would account for 10 feet, right? Now, um, as we come down to the, towards the end, you'll see there's a side takeoff. If it's a round side takeoff off of the trunk, sorry, <clears throat> then we account for 15 feet. Remember I was saying anything off the top, uh, and this happens a lot in the basement because people like to hide those takeoffs up inside bays. If they come off the top of the trunk, that's a 40 or 50 foot fitting compared to coming off the side with a 15 foot fitting, all right? Uh, so a big difference. No, what you want to do is keep the lowest equivalent length values for the ones that are furthest away. Um, Ed asks, can you show the longest run for which you were using this example? I'm sorry, Ed, I don't uh, exa exactly have a, a, a picture of this. I'm trying to walk you through uh, mentally of what it would look like in a basement. I apologize. I think that would be a, definitely an improvement for my presentation, um, especially if you haven't done duck layout before. So. Um, yeah, uh, if you can imagine a trunk going right down the middle of, of a basement, 
and we're just going to calculate the longest run. So we have that first plenum starting collar, 20 feet of actual trunk to get there, one transition in that trunk, and then of course the side takeoff. This is that branch duct that's for that longest run. And now in this example, there's just 15 feet of round branch duct going over to a right angle boot that's in the floor. So that's the longest run. You'll notice it's very, very simple. There's not a lot of turns, there's not stack heads, there's not all kinds of crazy stuff in here. But I, I did this on purpose to show you the high values. If you keep a duct system simple using really low fitting values, you can actually run into trouble with friction loss on the high end, okay? Now, of course, on the return side, it's the 65 foot right angle return drop we talked about earlier that's typically used. And then 15 feet of return trunk that just went over to a floor register, central return in that first floor of Colonial or Cape, all right? Not normal duct design, but you see it a lot on system replacements. That's why we're using this. So when you add up all of these numbers, it ends up being 175 feet. And that sounds like a big number, but it's not. I've designed systems with four or 500 feet of duct in equivalent length. All right. Um, so don't be scared when you get these numbers. And in fact, this is really low when you talk about a whole floor in the largest, uh, longest equivalent length. So we're going to actually plug these two numbers in to see what the friction loss is for this higher static air handler or mid static air handler. You can see 0.26 is what was available times the constant of 100 divided by 175 feet, the equivalent length of the longest run. And we're right at the maximum when it comes to design friction loss. Remember the maximum you can design around is 0.16. What this is telling me is we need to slow the fan speed down or use a couple of bad fittings to get the friction loss lower. Otherwise we're gonna have a noisy system, all right? And this is where um, customers, especially on a new duct system, if we're not designing using the right friction loss, people can get in trouble with higher static air handlers because it's gonna ramp up in order to deliver the volume of air that we need and when it ramps up, if it's a static pressure goes up, the velocity goes up. And that's when we start to get complaints, okay? So just because you see bad fittings doesn't mean the system wasn't designed around a bad fitting. So really important, instead of using that nice, easy transition, and hopefully you can see my pointer here, um, the 1D fitting, that's a nice tapered fitting going into your trunk off the plenum, that's a 10 foot fitting. If instead you use what's pictured in the bottom right here, which would be a bullhead T. And we see this a lot with newer construction homes, not by on purpose, right? Where um, on a new construction home, they might rough in the trunk and the branches before the plumber gets in or the electrician gets in and you lose all of those bays. And then once hopefully you get some sort of deposit, you come back with your equipment and you stab it into the bottom of the trunk. That becomes a bullhead T because it's not a full box. You can't pressurize that box. The air, if you can imagine, is hitting the bottom inside of that trunk, and it's a bullhead T now. If you were to make the box the full height and stab the trunk into the side, that would be a 35 foot fitting instead of 120 foot fitting. A couple of questions came in. Um, since the shortest equivalent length runs will have an actual friction loss higher than the longest equivalent length run, why doesn't calculating just for the longest run get you get into trouble with the other runs? That lately is because we have balancing dampers and we can balance the duct system out. Um, so if we can't get the air to the longest run, then we're gonna have a comfort problem. So we always wanna make sure we design around the longest and then we balance the system. That's the last step. Um, if we don't balance, we could then run into other problems. And we do see this a lot with new homes. Unfortunately, balancing on a new home isn't isn't enforced typically on, on, a, on a residential code. But if you're doing commercial, that's enforced. You need to do that. You need to do balancing in order to get a occupation uh, certificate, right? So, or whatever they call it, please forgive me. I'm in Massachusetts. So we'll probably call it something different in Vermont. Um, hopefully that answers your question, Lee. Uh, Steve says, do turning veins affect equivalent length? Yes, turning veins, if done correctly, evenly spaced small veins at the correct angle will reduce equivalent length drastically. I actually had some slides on that, but I took it out. It really does get used a lot in commercial, especially on flat 90s. Um, does not get used very often correctly in residential applications because instead of just using um, a right angle return drop in the return, let's say at 65 feet, you could put veins in, uh, evenly spaced small veins to get the air to make a nice easy transition turn in that whole 90 and drop it to 20 feet. Or you just have an internal radius and drop it to 30 feet. It's not a huge difference in that example. 
So Steve says he has them in your house. Yeah. Typically, if you do residential HVAC or you do commercial HVAC, you probably use the better fittings in your house, I would hope. It's not typically like carpenters, like the carpenter's house, the last one done. Um, but I'm going to be honest, at my house, I have one pipe steam. That's because I have an old colonial. But we're getting there. We're going to have heat pumps soon. Um, i got to do the roof first. All right. Um, so just back to the presentation, just so we can keep on time here. Um, you can see here, if I used a bullhead tee, which is 120 foot fitting, instead of a 10 foot fitting, instead of 275 equivalent feet, now it's up to 285. And when we do this math, we have a friction loss that's perfect for design right in the middle of the minimum and maximum for design friction loss. So this duct system would actually do better with a bullhead tee because it would be less noisy and um, the, the system uh, won't, uh, you know, I'm trying to say the velocity will actually be better in the supply if you do it this way. Um, it's not going to be cranking because the system would be, the duct system would be too small. Okay. So sometimes a bullhead tee is good. Now the time to fix this is when you do a system replacement or during design, right? You don't want to install a system and then say, oh my gosh, the guys used a bullhead tee. Then you're reinstalling the entire system to fix it, right? It's got to be part of the plan. Um, got to have the map before you enter the woods, right? And then when we size these runs, the same process applies. I'm going to walk through this. It's going to be a little quick, but that's because I want to spend time on the design. We already walked through how to size runs, okay? Um, I just want to make sure you can see it. But even with a longer list, the same process applies. So we would take our heating the CFM and divide it by the heat loss for that first floor in this example, which was 37,900. Remember that comes off of your manual J version eight, ACO approved software. Three decimal points is the max you wanna go. In this example, it was 0 0.025. Of course, with this heat pump, it's the same volume of air and cooling, less BTU needed and sensible only. Remember latent is taken out at the coil. So only sensible for our duct design. 23 to 12, when we do the math, it's 0 0.040. So those two numbers get transferred over to our duct sizing worksheet. Oh my gosh. Sorry about that, guys. I'm off by one thousandth on my, uh, <laughs> on my worksheet. I don't think it's going to change the size of the runs, but I need to fix that for my max presentation. All right. Um, and then, of course, we're going to transfer over that 0 0.09 friction loss with the bullhead T that we added, right? Um, that's our design friction loss. And then we're going to list each room that this is servicing. So this must be a ranch in this example, not a, not a, not a uh, colonial like I was talking about before, but you can see a kitchen, a living room and three bedrooms that we're servicing. Um, I'm gonna be honest, I don't know why the bathroom is in here. Most likely want to heat and cool the bathroom, uh, but for training purposes, we'll just keep what the list is. So we're gonna list the heat loss of each room and then we're gonna list the sensible heat gain for each room. And uh, Steve, just to follow up on your question, yeah, 0 .0, uh, 0 0.09 friction loss uh, comes from the calculated friction rate. So the available static times 100 divided by the equivalent length of the longest run gives us friction loss. If you remember, originally it was 0.15, it was really high. We added a bullhead T in order to make the friction loss go down in that example. The other al alternative was we could go back through design instead of running at a 0.5 static pressure to start with maybe 0 .0, 0 0.3, which is our low static option, but then we don't have the ability of turning it down. Remember, we always want the ability for our technicians to turn it up or down. So that's why we design around a medium speed and medium friction loss. I'm sorry, medium static pressure. I wanna confuse it too. Hopefully that answered your question. All right. Um, of course, simple math here, heat loss for the kitchen times heating factor gives me heating CFM. And another rule of duct design, like I talked about earlier, if it's over 200, split that into two runs. For the this worksheet, we're just going to keep it simple for class purposes. Cooling gains for that kitchen times the cooling factor gives me cooling CFM. Now, in this example, we're going to design around the cooling CFM needed for the kitchen, which is 234. It's the larger of the two, right? Um, 234 CFM at 0 0.09 on our duct calculator gives me an eight-inch run. And then I would walk through the same for the other rooms. Living room heating, heating heat loss times heating factor gives me 117. Cooling gains, sensible, times cooling factor gives me 106. The higher the two is 117. That ends up being a six inch. And we do the same for all of them, right? Then we go back and verify velocity. It's really important. Don't omit that. Now, if we get to designing around minimums, 
when it comes to supply, like in the kitchen here, I have, if I have a short run, I'm okay with designing around 700 feet per minute. If I have a long run, I don't want to have that pressure loss down the run and lower velocity by the time it hits the register. So I would downsize that run if it makes sense and I'm not gonna be above the max. So in this example, I might keep it an eight inch if it's short, if it's going to be long, I would see what, if I go down to a seven inch, what's that volume of air going to give me? And is it above the maximum? All right. Because we can't go above 900 in that example. We do the same for the rest of them. You can see that six inches is a little, little short. If it's short, maybe below that's okay. We might want to downsize that to a five inch. I have a feeling at 117 CFM, right, for a five inch duct, the velocity is going to be too high. Um, in order to actually, yeah, it's going to be around um, 800 feet per minute. So we could go to a five inch in that example. If it's short, maybe keeping a six inch is okay. So keep in mind, this is not a definitive number here. Um, it's, your, it's your application of the duct system um, and the map when it comes to designing the system and what's supposed to be installed. This duct sizing worksheet, oh, grab the wrong thing, duct sizing worksheet, and an actual drawing of the floor plan on top of a floor plan with the trunk and branch, right, is what typically goes to the code inspector in order to verify that this design matches what was installed. All right. Now, if you're using some software like WriteSoft or some of the other ones, some of that's built in and, and it actually does the drawing for you. If you're not, if you're using a more of a worksheet style, it does this calculation for you. Uh, but you have to make sure you enter in the right fittings you're using, the right static pressure you're starting with, the right volume of air you're starting with. Otherwise, this uses default values, maybe off of an AHRI certificate or something. So you have to look up the manufacturer specs to enter into the design software to get the right output. It's just a calculator. If you put the wrong numbers in, you're going to get the wrong numbers out, right? Um, so we do the same all the way down. You can see that last run, 170 CFM. And an eight inch was way too low static. So we had to go to a seven inch to get the, the velocity back up. All right. Once we have all the runs, sizing the trunks is actually really easy. And for time purposes, I didn't include this in the presentation, but you can see there's another section on the bottom for sizing your supply and sizing your return trunks. And if you follow the rules of duct design I'm about to walk through, it becomes very obvious. So basically after every two to three takeoffs, you wanna see how much volume of air is left check your velocity. And when it gets below 700 feet per minute, you downsize your trunk to get the, the velocity back up for the remaining part of volume of air that's going to those spaces. All right, so pretty simple. Hey, Kristen, if you yes. wanna take a moment to pause, there are some additional questions. We wanna make sure we hit. Absolutely. What do you got for me? Uh, I think, Bryn, I, I missed, a, I might've missed a couple. I saw some of them come in, I tried to address them, but they came or, in fast and curious. <laughs> um, Steve has uh, a, a question I can't remember if you already responded to. Did turning veins affect TEL positive or negatively? I did address that one. Okay, um, yeah, turning veins will reduce TEL equivalent length, but unfortunately in residential, it often doesn't get done right. So you can't field install that. You want to put that into or, or order the fitting from the shop with those veins already installed correctly. All right. And then I think you uh, addressed Leeling's question. If we calculate friction rate for each run, can we downsize the ducts instead of using uh, balance dampers? Um, if we calculate friction rate for each run, can we downsize the ducts instead of balance dampers? Um, hmm. So if you do that, which, yeah. So that may work, but it's not, it's not manual D, Lee. Um, so I've actually never done it that way. Uh, the friction loss, a balance system, uh, excuse me, uh, manual D talks about a balanced friction loss system. So you're going to use the same friction loss in the return as using the supply, and we're using velocity to adjust. In your example, um, you may be able to calculate the friction loss for each run. And I mean, I personally would put a balancing damper in every single run because it's never perfect. But yeah, you're right. You might not need balancing dampers if you do it that way. But that's not manual D. That would be um, a little bit more advanced. Great. And then um, Steve had a couple more questions related to the calculations. Oh, yeah, I see them. So the 37.9 was actually uh, pulled out of uh, manual J version 8. So normally, the, like, 
if I was to do a full four hour design class, we would use, we'd go through uh, manual J, get the report and use that report as we go. Um, with doing just manual D, we have to assume you did the load calculation and you took those numbers in order to do the D design. So yeah, it would have came out of the software model. Um, and then uh, where the 910 came from, yes, 910 CFM was our medium volume of air. And just to show you, I'm gonna kick back up quite a few slides just to get to um, the submittal for the SVZ air handler. So that comes off of your submittal. Um, you're gonna select medium speed volume of air and medium static. So that was 910 CFM in this example with a wet coil and half an inch of water column for your static pressure to start with. Let me just get back to where I was. Awesome, thanks. Clicks. No problem. Thanks, Chris. Anytime, anytime. Thanks, thanks for stopping me there. <laughs> All right, now of course, balancing dampers, perfect follow-up for what Leah mentioned. Um, you have to deliver what you wanted to deliver to each room, right? Not just the, the initial trunk. You need to make sure that you're actually balancing the system out to get the full volume of air to each space. Otherwise you're gonna have uncomfortable rooms, right? Uh, a lot of people avoid this or don't do this correctly in residential applications. There's actually a balancing testing uh, manual. It's manual B, and that would be the last piece. It's part of design and verification, all right? Um, of course, you would need balancing dampers in there in order to adjust airflow. There is a process. There's like three different ways to balance a system correctly, and they walk you through each one in manual B. And if you're doing hydronic systems, it walks you through that way as well. All right. All right. So some rules of duct design. Really important. Um, if you're having airflow issues or noise problems, these are probably the first things you want to look for. Before I do, Andy had a... a um, a question here for low CFM systems, the powered flow hood is much more accurate. Absolutely. So that Alnor that I pictured is the probably least expensive. That's great for vo high volume of air. When you get to low static and low volume of air, you want the powered ones. Um, I think uh, Energy Conservatory makes one, I believe, just like their duct blaster. Um, there's a few other ones out there, Andy. It, it, feel free. If you know some offhand, um, please throw them into the uh, chat. So yeah, it's a fan assisted, Steve, uh, for flow hood, for low volume of air, which is what you would see a lot of times in a low load home with small, low static air handlers, all right? Um, and what you'll find is they're actually really good for measuring ventilation as well. That's another whole story, all right? Um, all right, so rules of duct design. If you're having noise or airflow problems, you wanna make sure this is all set, all of these, 10 or 12 things I'm going to run through first before you start modifying volume of air or refrigerant charge or anything else with the system. If the duct design is incorrect or it doesn't meet the rules of duct design, there's no adjustment to the system that you can make that's going to fix this. Okay. That's like having the wrong size system installed. It's the same thing. Like you can't crank it way up or crank it way down and expect to get the right latent and sensible split and all the other design stuff. You got to design the system right. Right. Um, so first off, you could run up to 24 feet of trunk and use one size, but typically you have more than just a couple of takeoffs. So you're going to have to downsize that trunk. And at the very minimum, if you use more than 24 feet of trunk, you're going to reduce the trunk every 15 to 20 feet. With residential applications, that's actually going to happen more often because you have more takeoffs coming off of one trunk. Every time you make a takeoff, uh, I'm sorry, every time you downsize that trunk, you wanna have a taper in the trunk. Please don't just put an end cap and stab into that smaller end cap. That is a huge value and pressure loss, right? So that wouldn't meet the, the, the rules of duct design. And what's gonna happen is you're gonna depressurize. You're not gonna get the air. There's gonna be a lot of turbulence on the large size and you're gonna get airflow there, but anything past that end cap and you stab into it for the next run is gonna have very low volume of air and very low velocity because of that turbulence. So a long taper is what you wanna use. All right, so those are three. Now, standard trunk is typically eight inches in height. You can go eight inches by 32 is your maximum width you can go before you have to go to 10 inch trunk. So it's four times the width, all right? So um, it, that, that's the aspect ratio, right? So you can't have a crazy aspect ratio of really thin, by really wide duct because you're going to have weird pressure losses and a lot of turbulence. Okay. Um, on a supply and return, when the trunk is wider than the plenum, 
you have to use a transition fitting. And I don't have a picture of this in this particular presentation. I have some in some other ones I do, but this happens a lot when you have a system replacement in a vertical application and they add, let's say a cabinet air filter right next to it. Now this pushes the return drop out compared to what was there. And it may not line up with your typical return trunk that's running down that, that uh, basement, let's say. And if you don't use a transition fitting to get back there, you're going to block not the full size by just stabbing it into the corner of it. All right. So anytime the trunk is wider than the plenum, you have to use a transition fitting. You can't just stab it into the side of it like I was talking about before. Oh, boy. So we have some bad pictures as we go to. I'm sure people have probably seen this one. This is a popular one from ACA. Um, when you talk about takeoffs, there's some rules that are specific. So you want to offset takeoffs rather than straight takeoffs, meaning um, as you're coming down, even if you have a perfect rectangle trunk, you don't want to just uh, have a straight takeoff off the side, a perpendicular. If you can taper that takeoff, right, then it's easier for the air to make the turn into that branch and the equivalent length value is much lower. And you rely on balancing instead of cranking the vo velocity and the static pressure up, okay? Also stagger the takeoffs off of the trunk. Don't have them directly across from each other because that provides a big pressure loss when you move, lose that much volume of air on what's uh, on the other side. Plus the air ha now has to make a choice. Do I go left or right? If you stagger it, you're gonna get the full volume of air to each, okay? And then of course, if you're gonna put a damper in, which you should, especially on a, a, a trunk and branch system, then you wanna damper the run as close to the trunk as possible. That's why most takeoffs have the damper actually installed in the takeoff these days. If you're gonna add dampers, don't put them at the register and don't use the, the, the register um, adjustment as a way of balancing because it's gonna be noisy when the system cranks up because now this, the free area is lower and your velocity goes up to move the same volume of air through it, okay? Or it's going to be too restrictive on a PSC style motor and decrease the volume of air going to that space. So always put the dampers as close to the trunk as possible to avoid noise and get the right volume of air out. Some more bad pictures. Don't branch off. This was the one that, please forgive me, I think it was Steve that brought up. Um, don't branch off any closer than one foot from the end of the trunk, that end cap. So you can see as an example, what's bad Somebody took something right off the end of the end cap on the top picture here, and that's obviously existing. And then they added two more, really, just to make sure there's nothing going to the entire system. So if you're within a foot of that end cap, it depressurizes the trunk and all the air goes to that one takeoff, all right, or two takeoffs. Um, this is a tough one. The second one down is really hard to abide by. Um, and I put this in here just so that way you guys can, you know, give it as much space as possible. You don't want to have a takeoff within four feet of a reduction of a trunk or one and a half times the greater dimension of the trunk, right? So if it's 20 inch wide, um, you don't want to be within 30 inches of that. This is really hard to do residentially. The key here is just stay as far away from a reduction in the trunk as possible so you don't depressurize it like, it, like the end cap example. And then of course, you never take off a reduction or increase the mains any closer than that same duct diameter, right? So, uh, cause it'll give you the same effect. It'll depressurize the rest of the trunk and all the air will go to that one spot. So even though it's convenient and you have a nice easy taper on that trunk, oh man, how easy would it be to, to avoid using nineties and stuff or a 45 and just come off the side there? It's gonna be a problem. You're gonna depressurize the rest of the house. Um, yeah, please forgive me. Uh, Joseph asks, are there any benefits to leaving more than a foot? Um, nope. Um, if you have at least a foot, it, the system's going to work correctly. Um, anything more is, I'm going to be honest, is probably going to be a little bit of a waste of trunk, um, but it might save you from having to cut it. So maybe it saves you a little bit of labor. Um, other than that, I can't think of any other benefit. All right. Um, there's plenty of poor duck work out there. Everybody puts them on uh, social media. This is a great picture from Allison Bales. Um, that's what we'd call the Kraken, right? Um, everybody, when you see bad duck, duck work, you know it's bad, right? This is another example. If uh, you see that moisture on the basement, imagine what's inside this duct work. There's a reason this duct work is sagging, right? Um, you have to install a duct correctly. There's, uh, you know, there's actually rules for flexible duct design as well. Um, one of them is you actually have to hang it 
no further than 18 inches with solid hangers, right? You can't use tape to hang a, a flex duct. Um, also, just because it might look okay doesn't mean there's nothing in there restricting airflow. Um, you can see somebody actually in this example in the bottom right, just use a pizza box as a transition. Um, if you don't see a large taper and you see things like flex duct with connectors and boxes, I'm willing to bet you're going to have big restrictions. Andy said, can trunk size match the supply collar dimensions on an SEZ? Yes, it can, but it's at the maximum. And with low static air handlers, um, if you're just going to make a, typically what most people do is make a box and just take the takeoffs off the end of the box, 10 or 12 inches in depth there. Um, Cause you don't want to have big pressure losses and you don't have the static pressure to overcome that. Uh, so most people don't, but yes, you can, if it's going to be uh, a long trunk and you're going to take stuff tapered off the sides, maybe two or three runs would be okay with an SEC with that size. I know it's very close to the aspect ratio. And that's why I was saying before low static air handlers have a different process and some things we ignore in order to make it work compared to mid or high static air handlers. All right. All right, so there is some drawback with flex. Um, I would say the number one drawback is uh, what happens to friction rate because people don't actually pull that taut, the helix on the inside. So if you have less than 4% compression on a flexible duct, then you use the normal friction rate, right? Everybody, uh, just so you know, this is for galvanized sheet metal. When you use a duct calculator, they do make ones for flex runs and there's an adjustment for compression. Basically with residential applications, the rule is you pull that helix straight and tight. And if you wanna make any turns, you use hard 90s, all right? You shouldn't be making turns with flexible duct. But like, like that picture from Allison um, on the previous slide, every run sometimes is 20 feet because that's what came in the box, right? And that's what we need to avoid. I've actually seen some systems with contractors cut out more flex and remove than what was actually needed and used in the house. It's crazy out there. Just, uh, I'm sorry, just 15% compression, you would have to double the friction rate in order to get that system to work. And what that means is a large, much larger size duct in order to get that same volume of air there because of all the pressure loss inside that helix with the compression rate, with the, with the poor compression, right? And 30% compression, which is what we see when people don't pull it out, they just pull it out of the box and they don't pull that helix at all. Um, would be four times your friction rate. It quadruples it, which makes the duct ridiculously large in order to get the same volume of air there. But if you install flex duct correctly, it can be used right. Now, I would avoid it when it comes to low static air handlers as much as possible. We want hard duct, straight, large sweeping turns with smooth 90s, if we can. Keep the equivalent length value as low as possible, all right? Um, obviously, filters can cause um, some airflow problems. Uh, and the reason I bring this up is because as a good indicator on velocity issues, if we see blower wheels in standard air handlers look like this. If the filter is clean and the blower wheel looks like this, chances are the velocity of the air is so high that it's bypassing the filter or it's going right through it. And I've seen this a lot on ECM furnaces when the, duct work, when the duct work was not modified for the larger volume of air that's needed for that furnace compared to the old inefficient 80%, right? Um, extreme face velocity, what ends up happening is it almost eats the filter away. I've taken filters out of furnaces and almost seen right through a, a MERV 7 blue filter because the velocity was so high, it just deteriorated that thing. And all of the dirt ended up in the blower wheel or the secondary heat exchanger or the coil on a, on a heat pump, right? Um, so these things should be triggers on service, not, oh my gosh, they probably never, you know, the, the first thought of most technicians is they probably replaced this filter before I showed up, right? Um, I'm willing to bet if they measure static pressure or measure velocity, they would be able to tell really easily if that system is within design, if it was designed, right? So in order to measure uh, static pressure, I mean, I personally have used magnet helix in the past. These days we use manometers. Um, they're digital. They give you a much quicker, more accurate number. Uh, but all you need is a magnet helix or manometer. I highly recommend a dual input manometer that, read, that reads Pascals. Um, 25 Pascals is a tenth of an inch, right? So it's just the metric version, but it's more accurate. Um, and then, of course, a static pressure probe, not a pitot tube. Pitot tube will measure total pressure, 
Static pressure tips, when you point them into the airstream, will measure the pressure on the duct system only, okay? So it excludes velocity pressure. You'll notice the tip is blanked off here and there's just holes on the side. If I turn that pressure probe the wrong way, it would measure velocity, not pressure, right? So really important, you're using it correctly and you measure in the right spot. This can give you a great indication as to what the volume of air is on the old system or what the static pressure is on the old system before you make a replacement or an adjustment, all right? Um, so when you're measuring this, you wanna measure as close to the box that's shipped with the blower as possible. So it's really easy with like a Mitsubishi air handler, right? Because the coil and the blower and everything's all in that box. And if we just use that washable filter that ship with the unit, we can just put a, a, a hole in the supply and return, probably 10 to 12 inches away from each and measure supply and return static pressure. It's really, really easy. What ends up being tougher is when you have, um, let's say a furnace, uh, uh, high efficient filter cabinet, and you throw an A coil on top of a furnace. And now we have to try to measure as close to that furnace as possible. So typically myself, what I would do is measure in the blower compartment and measure in where the, the high limit switch used to be. I'd have to pull it out, put the probe in where the high limit switch is because it's, it's previous to the A coil. Because those uh, filter boxes and A coils are not shipped with the furnace as part of that package, right? So you have to account for that pressure drop. If you measure after it, you're gonna measure a much lower pressure in the supply compared to what it is prior to the coil. And that's not really how the system's running, all right? And when you add these two numbers together, you would actually ignore the negative. It's on the return, obviously return sucking air in. It's a negative pressure. Um, look at it as an absolute number and we're measuring differential pressure. So if we, as an example, measure negative 0.2 on the return, and positive 0.2 in the supply, your total external static pressure in that example would be 0 0.40. So um, you can look at it as an absolute or as a differential, right? I won't get into how we used to measure it with actual water. That's another whole thing. We have much better, more accurate tools these days. So static pressure, what I want you guys to understand is it's kind of like blood pressure, all right? So the higher the blood pressure, the worse our bodies are, right? We can only overcome so much. We, we have, we have a, an amount that's supposed to be. If it's too low or too high, we have a problem. And static pressure for any ducted system is the same thing, right? Too high blood pressure, heart struggles to pump. Too high static pressure, the blower struggles to run. Or we drastically increase the KWH of that ECM motor in order to deliver that same volume of air, all right? Um, so as an example, uh, if it's rated for 0.5 or the design was 0.5, but we're running at 0.75 total, we have a problem, right? And when we start the system up, that might say, oh, I need to turn the fan speed down to design. Or if we're out there on service, it might say, maybe my coil's dirty or my secondary heat exchanger is dirty or my, my filter's clogged, right? Uh, yes, Lee, we're talking about total external static pressure here. Yep. Um, so, uh, not just one side, both sides and you add them together, right? So supply plus the return. Now, if there's a big imbalance, that would be really easy to know where the problem is. So as an example, if I had 0.1 static pressure on the supply, and in this example on the bad negative 0.65 in the return, oh my gosh, my return's really restricted. Let's find out what's going on. And I've seen everything from, you know, people putting furniture in front of return ducts to, um, uh, insulation on the inside of return ducts. When you turn it on, insulation folds down. Um, filters that were insulated over that people didn't know were in there for 10 years. It's amazing. Um, once you start measuring things, you start measuring the invisible, what you start to find. All right. Um, and ideally, we want to get this as close to design as possible. If we set the right airspeed, then we should have the right static pressure. All right. Um, if your normal blood pressure is 120 over 80, um, obviously bad blood pressure would be much higher, right? So that's the idea here. Kind of relate it to something that you might know. Um, there are approved ways of measuring volume of air. Um, I personally, um, and, and Lisa, for commissioning purposes, is measuring external static pressure a, a good way to judge duct installation quality. Not by itself. That plus volume of air is a good way to, to, to um, 
to judge uh, duct installation quality. Now, um, I don't have the manual offhand. There's an ANSI ACA manual that just came out for quality of HVAC installation and grading. If you're an energy rater, you probably know what I'm talking about right offhand. It's probably the first time three or like uh, three or four organizations actually agreed on a process. And uh, they walk through grading duct systems and you would measure uh, temperature, static pressure, and measure volume of air in order to grade that duct system versus what the design was, right? It needs to be within a certain percentage of what the design is. So there are approved airflow methods of measuring. I personally am not a fan, even though I own a hot wire and a minivan anemometer, these measurements are not very repeatable. Every time I take this measurement, because my hand's slightly different or the angle's just off a little bit, the measurement's always different. Um, it's usually within 10% of what I, I measured last time, um, but uh, because it's not as repeatable, I don't recommend it very often. Um, but you would take evenly spaced holes across there to do a cross section of the duct with a mini vein or hot wire anemometer. It would measure feet per minute and you would convert that to cubic feet per minute based on the size of the duct. I'm not gonna go into the depth here other than that. That's one method. Another method is using a pitot tube or static pressure probe and having the chart. Okay, that's really easy, much quicker. Um, you could use a flow hood, but you need to make sure you adjust for duct leakage. Um, of course, you could do duct plaster pressure matching, which means you test the leakage of the system, and then you turn the system back on with all of the uh, all of the the pieces open. You turn your duct blaster on and match the static pressure in the supply, so all your air is moving through your duct blaster. This works good on a system that's probably three tons or less because duct blaster has a tough time getting above twelve hundred cfm. Um, and then the last one, which is the one I personally love because it's so repeatable and I always get the same number and it's quick, is using a true flow plate from the Energy Conservatory. There's little plates, as long as you can slide this in a central return, um, at either at the furnace or air handler, um, you're able to uh, do a cross section of the duct with pressure, velocity pressure. The meter will actually change it right over to CFM for you. Um, or you can take a dual input manometer and convert uh, pressure to CFM on their chart. So those are the approved methods from ACA, quality installation, and um, the Energy Star checklist. Those are the ones you could use to measure volume of air. And if you know static pressure and you know volume of air, it's a great judge of duct design. Of course, you still need to get the air there, so it should be sealed, right? These are some of the things to look for regarding, um, you know, if you have uncomfortable situations and you think there's a duct issue, walk through those, those duct design problems I talked about first, those rules of duct design, and then look for what I would consider the obvious, right? Um, of course, just because it's not sealed doesn't mean you can seal it. You have to measure static pressure, right? So there's so obvious pros to duct sealing, providing better comfort, more conditioned air is delivered to the space, right? And obviously we're not taking air from the basement or the attic, um, and better IAQ, and all the air is going to be filtered now if we have a good filter. There's some cons though, okay? Um, it's not always good. If you measure static pressure and you seal up a poor duct system or restricted, it's just going to make the static pressure go up and make volume of air go down more, all right? It's like um, using gum to plug a hole in a water dam, right? It's just going to come out elsewhere. Um, obviously, uh, it's going to um, start to bypass things and cause systems to fail if uh, we have a really restrictive return, let's say, like I was talking about before, the dirt could just go right through or around the filter. Um, and obviously it creates unbalanced pressures in what could be a combustion appliance zone in a basement. So if we seal up everything and, and we st start uh, to pull more air through the holes at the return in the basement, we could depressurize that combustion appliance zone enough to, let's say, pull air back from an atmospheric water heater or something like that. We have to be careful. And I highly recommend anytime don't someone does a new ducted system in a home or air seals or insulates a duct system or alters speed, anything, you do a combustion appliance zone test per the BPI standard. You don't want to do what you think is the right thing in a house um, and hurt someone. Steve has a great thing. Yeah. Don't use atmospheric appliances. Absolutely. Especially on a new construction house, right? Oh my God. But if you're doing something to an existing home, you have to measure it. Just because you didn't measure it doesn't mean you're off the hook. I would, I, I couldn't sleep at night if I didn't measure it afterwards. All right. Um, a good duct system, believe it or not, loses about 20% uh, uh, or 20 to 25% based on studies done by Energy Star. 
Um, and this is obviously done by the Department of Energy. Um, so what they say makes a good uh, duct system, you can see is sealed and insulated correctly to code, um, compress flex less than 20% on straight duct runs and less than 50% on bends. I say don't use flex on bends, use hard 90s, that'll fix that problem. And then you have to secure the ductwork at least every 18 inches using a non-tape method. This is in the International Mechanical Code, which I think every state in New England abides by, but this isn't necessarily always enforced. Building inspectors don't necessarily uh, use that. So um, yeah, Lee, uh, fuel fired, if you're using atmospheric, meaning you're taking combustion air from the space the appliance is in, and it's not a sealed combustion system. So it tends to be less efficient models. Um, tends to have combustion appliance zone issues when we add things like ducted systems or we seal duct work or um, the air's got to come from somewhere, right? And if we don't get it perfect, it could come from where that atmospheric um, you know, natural gas water heater is, let's say. Hopefully that explains it. All right. Um, so really easy um, on poorly sealed and poorly insulated ducts to lose half of the capacity on a furnace or, or an AC system. It's crazy how bad it can be out there. Um, and you can see just 20% leakage, 25% conduction losses because people are still putting ductwork in attics. Um, and then just 5% for infiltration because we're depressurizing different spaces. And we could lose 50% of what that system was trying to do for the home. But if we seal and insulate it correctly and we have minimal losses, minimal conduction losses or none because it's within the building, we can really improve the, the performance of the system. And actually, if it's a new system, install a smaller unit, right? It uses less electricity. Um, if we compress insulation, right? Just 2% uh, as an example here, 2% um, of air voids, and this is actually out of an ACA presentation, could reduce the insulation value in half. So as an example here, if you come, if you the thickness is reduct, re, reduced just 50% of duct insulation, you can see we reduce an R11 down to R7. And that may not meet what the design was. We might have designed around R11 on the supply duct. And if we compress it too much because it's tight or um, we're pushing down on that insulation because it goes into a, um, a bay or a, a ceiling or something like that, now we have R11 duct work and it might not keep up for that space under, de under uh, typical demand days. All right, so before I, I show the last two slides here, I always show this because I wanna make sure everybody understands to do the right thing costs money, right? I know Mitsubishi in every market is not the cheapest brand. So typically a Mitsubishi customer probably understands the cost, right? Uh, meaning contractors, distributors, uh, we're very fortunate to have, in my opinion, the best distributors in the market. And I say that whether I'm doing a Mitsubishi presentation or an HVAC Pro blog presentation. Um, they're not the cheapest, uh, but typically you can usually have two of these. So you can have good and fast, which means it's gonna be more expensive. You can have fast and cheap, which probably won't be the best quality. You could have good and cheap, which will take some time to get you what you want because we're, we're gonna sell the stuff at a higher margin, right? Um, if you want all three, most customers are dreaming. Hate to say it, uh, and I think you guys know if you're an HVAC contractor, most customers want all three and they want all, the, and it's unrealistic expectations. Um, the best thing you can do is educate a homeowner when you're out there in a sales call and not just say you have to replace the duct system or you have to fix the duct system, but educate them on why. So that way when the next contractor comes in and they low bid the project without any of those improvements, there's a value difference there and they understand why the system's larger and why they use more KWH and all these other things, right? Um, Katrina asks, do you have any comments on insulated duct versus non-insulated duct? Yeah, oh my God, uh, I'll keep it brief. So uh, if it's outside the building envelope, the code is R8, you have to have insulated duct work. Um, I've, seen un, I've seen uninsulated ductwork in basements, which is fine on a heating only system. If you are going to run air conditioning down in a basement in any condition space, you really need to insulate ductwork, even if it's not required in your municipal. And that's because we don't want the ductwork to get below the dew point of the air, which would create it just to rain. And I've seen moisture form in you know, conditioned ceilings in a basement because they did this. And it passes code 
but realistically you can't live like that you can't always add moisture to you know ceilings <laughs> um and he says even if folks say they don't want air conditioning they will and they'll use it that's for sure um and they say the same thing about heat pumps sometimes in the fall right um i don't need hyperheat or, or cold climate heat pump right um until they feel how comfortable it is and it's much less cost compared to the oil they were running then they want the heat right so um yeah it goes both ways so if you're going to do it do it right the first time um and don't just add an a coil on top of a furnace without insulating that duct that's what creates that problem all right so before I close this out, I do have some time for Q&A. Um, I want to make sure everybody knows you can get tons of free follow-up learning. The first one I'm going to show you is uh, my blog. I actually have a YouTube channel. If you scan the QR code, it should take you right to it. Everything on YouTube is free. There's 50 videos. I typically have hundreds of people going there watching 15 to 20 hours of content every day. So highly recommend it. There's plenty of stuff on design manuals, J, S, and D on there plus a lot of other business things, anything related to residential HVAC contractors, I'm willing to bet there's a video on it already or I'm developing one. Um, really simple and easy. Highly recommend you learn something else new today. Um, and hopefully you already learned something new. Now, when it comes to Mitsubishi specific, I wanna make sure you know you can reach out to uh, Mike Gambaroni or Joe Armenti. We have hundreds of recorded e-learnings that you can access at any time of day for free. All right, so they just need to set you up on our contractor portal and you would have access to all of these e-learnings and some of them are prerequisites to show up for in-person training. So there's very little when it comes to system design on there, but there's great resources when it comes to system installation, service, technical um, controls and setup, you name it. If it's a Mitsubishi product, there's probably an e-learning available. And I highly recommend you check those out. Um, particularly if you are new to the product or uh, you are not completely confident with it because you haven't been to in-person training yet. You definitely want to knock those prerequisites out of the way. So I'm going to open this up, Brent, if you don't mind, for uh, Q&A. I think I have nine minutes, which I don't know if it's good or bad. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Um, certainly, uh, did you use the chat, but if you want to, if you prefer to just chat, uh, with Chris yourself, just raise your hand and I'll, um, pull you over to, to be able to use your microphone. Looks like we've got one question from Tom already. I don't know if you see that, Chris. I do. I'll just read it out. Um, so I have a homeowner who's interested in putting a cold climate heat pump while keeping his existing oil furnace and existing air handler in place for backup heat. He has found an internal heat pump condenser coil that he can use with the furnace's air handler. Is it possible to modulate the airflow in the air handler so that it works well in heat pump, but then when the furnace is needed, it also works well for the furnace, in spite of presumed differences of heat output, cycling and velocity requirements, and effective heat distribution for the two systems. All right, so what's going to be rough is um, you're going to be applying a heat pump to a duct system that was sized for the furnace. So I'm willing to bet it's not going to be perfect, but you could modify it or you can get it close. What's going to typically be good is depending on the efficiency of the furnace, if it's higher efficient, I'm willing to bet your heat pump volume of air will be lower than what is needed because it's probably not sized for 100% of the heating. So uh, the one, a couple of pitfalls I would say to, to avoid. Yes, if you use a heat pump thermostat and you have the capability of using that with the furnace, meaning there's more than one airflow selection for heating and cooling, then yes, you could do this. Um, the heat pump thermostat is gonna integrate. You could do that with Mitsubishi's with their integration stuff, right? So there's many manufacturers out there that provide uh, integration controls. Um, you're gonna wanna match the fan speed for the heat pump based on the capacity needs. And then when you switch over, it's obviously gonna run the furnace and we're gonna shut the heat pump off. We don't run a heat pump and a fossil fuel appliance at the same time. Obviously, with less volume of air, you got to check those registers. I'm willing to bet they're only going to throw a certain distance because they were sized for the furnace. So with lower volume of air, there's lower velocity and you need to make sure you communicate that to the homeowner. Like, look, it's going to feel like it's barely blowing. That's because it's part load and it runs at a lower volume of air. If you want me to redesign this entire system with a new furnace, we could, but it's going to be cost a lot more. Hopefully that makes sense to you, Tom. Um, Bryn, I just wanted to um, interject and ask Steve to unmute himself. Um, I believe that in Vermont, 
ducts outside the envelope have to be insulated to the same level as the enclosure of the building, um, not just R8. Great that's question. Our, so that's, oh, go ahead. And that's regarding energy code? The energy code, yes. Ah, so Vermont has a, a, a stretch energy code then that is above and beyond the 2018 mechanical code from the sounds of it or residential code. Let me look it up here quick and just confirm. There is some, there's a couple different scenarios for duct insulation. Um, give me just a moment and I can, I can dig it up here. Thanks, Steve. Actually, I'll just make a comment while you're, while you're doing that, if you don't mind. Um, it makes sense to insulate what it is to the ceiling, right? So as an example, if you have R38 in the ceiling and I only have R8 ducts, you can imagine where the weak spot in the ceiling is now and where all your heat loss is going to be, which creates condensation issues in the winter. So um, if you're able to get R30 on a duct system, absolutely, because it matches the ceiling, right? So uh, I'm glad to hear Vermont's done that. Most states in New England have not done that. Awesome. Yeah, I'll confirm, confirm Lee Ling's uh, note that there is, that is the, that is a, an update with the 2020 Vermont Arby's from the 2015 is that all supplied return ducts shall be insulated to meet the same R value requirement that applies to immediately proximal surfaces. So, so yeah. I'm going I'm to be honest here, Steve, it's going to be hard to get R30 I, on a duct. Totally <laughs> You're yeah. just better off putting it within the building or, or do ductless. Yeah, right? <laughs> exactly. And that's yeah. really, you know, rubber hits the road on this is just keeping the ducts work within the thermal envelope and, you know, it, it, in, at all circumstances possible. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a waste. Only in only in the United States do we do that, right? Large ducks with huge losses. Only in America. <laughs> you go anywhere else in the world, everybody's got ductless or everything's within the building. So great. Thanks. And while we're there, um, I do want to introduce Steve Spatz. He is our uh, residential energy code contact um, within Efficiency Vermont. So if there are additional technical trainings or questions that come up related to meeting um, energy code, please reach out to, um, to us. More than happy to provide one-on-one -on -one trainings. Um, we also have some recorded content and, and uh, recurring um, uh, online virtual live presentations as well. So um, more than happy to, to provide any, any and all support that's needed to meet um, the state's energy uh, residential energy code as well as commercial energy code. It's been a great session, Chris. Really appreciate all the attention to detail you put into this, and really, you know, put it out there in a, in a well communicated way. And uh, really happy to see this many people join uh, the the training here today as well. Um, so, you know, this is something that my myself and my colleague Lee Ling on the call here as well too, and many of the contractors on this uh, call here today are you know, interested in and want to make sure that we're getting best possible possible outcomes in the distribution side of the equation here um, on, on equipment. So definitely have a captive audience in that regard for this. Thanks. Yeah. That's great to hear. I, 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 so out of curiosity, is, is 50 above normal for you guys on, on, a, on a online training? This is We've got some good, we've had some really strong uh, trainings where uh, similar to this one that, that has brought in some good attendance. We had um, a uh, refrigerant leak detection training last spring about this time where it, it drew a high amount of attendance. And then throughout the year, we've we've had a number of other trainings. So That's yeah. That's, I'm glad you guys there, are Yeah, That's and there's some more That's questions yeah. coming in. I want to take advantage of, um, it's awesome. I don't, know if you saw the did. question so i see andy said we have insulated yeah. basement trunks to r15 or 20 to keep the temp drop down in ducts where basement is semi-conditioned yeah andy this is that's actually a really important point with variable speed systems because um the majority of the year you're running at part load right 98 percent of the year we designed for the 99 design temperature right 99 percent design temp so when the fan speed turns down the air becomes in contact with that ductwork for a longer period of time. And if you have poor insulation on it in an unconditioned space, even if it's within the building, you end up having higher losses than you expect. And uh, by the time the air gets to the longest run, because it's moving at a lower velocity and a lower volume of air, it's like not even lukewarm. And, the, you know, people do some crazy things like turn the temperature up or turn the fan speed up and it impacts the performance of the system. So by doing that, 
um, you're keeping all of the heat you're generating, right? But I shouldn't say generating because you're using a heat pump, you're really taking it from outside. That's not a whole thing. But uh, you actually deliver it to the space, not lose it to the unconditioned space. So R15 to R20 is pretty thick insulation, though. You need to plan for that. Chris, can I, can I, there's a, there's a follow on question about our code, which I don't think that you would really be able to address, but I just, um, I'm hoping that you can address the question of putting metal ducts in the attic under cellulose. Yeah. So I, if you do that, you want to, uh, you got to be careful here. So if it's an air conditioner and you're going to bury the duct system in cellulose, it needs to be well sealed and the ductwork should be insulated to begin with in contact with it. What ends up happening a lot of times is people just blow cellulose over it. And if you have any sort of air gap, that's where condensation starts to, to starts to form. So in, in air conditioning and heating is probably not going to be a problem. Um, so yeah, it, I'm going to be honest. So that's a, that's a tough one. You, obviously you want to do this after you install the ductwork and, um, you know, I think uh, it's not done correctly enough to trust sometimes as an HVAC contractor, but if you do it right, it adds such a higher level of R value to that duct system that it's such a great thing. I've seen people spray foam duct systems too, and they don't do it right. And um, you end up with these voids and moisture and stuff. It's unfortunate. And there's also a requirement in the code too, if there is going to be duct work that's buried in insulation, that it has it has a maximum uh, duct leakage uh, allowed, um, if that's the circumstance as well. Yeah, that's why, right? We can't have that yep, much. exactly. All right. So uh, there's a lot of stuff coming in all at once. Sorry, Brent. I'll try to get back. No, it's great. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thanks. Um, so Steve said he has uh, six inch supply and return drops in the basement and uh, they are open. So he didn't seal anything. Ah, uh, so you conditioned the basement. So that way you didn't have to do a duct test from the sounds of it. And that's a way around the code in Vermont. Is that right? Steve, are you there? Yeah. Sorry. Now I got distracted with something. Can you say the question again, please, Chris? Um, so it looks like Steve, uh, St. Hill Hillair had said that, um, he has a six inch supply and return drops in the basement. Um, and they're open, so we didn't have to seal anything. So it sounds like that's a like a maybe a loophole and a duct test for if you if you condition the basement by doing this, then you don't have to do a duct test. Is that right? Uh, yeah. If the duct work is within thermal envelope, then that that precludes you from needing to do duct leakage testing. Okay. So sure. I don't know if Vermont's going to change this, but in the in the twenty twenty one code for the for for the residential code and the IECC. Um, duct testing will be required, whether it's in the building envelope or not, in order to deliver the full volume of air to the space, right? Because balancing would be required. Um, but that's something in the future. Right. I, think. I don't think you guys have to enforce that now. Um, so next one on here. Uh, oh, Mike. Mike said thanks. No worries, Mike. Anytime, man. Um, so Casey says, uh, does, does that apply if the duct in the attic and the R30 insulation is applied over or on top of the duct? I think um, we just addressed that with what Lee said. Um, Steve, I believe if you insulate over the duct and um, there's no voids, it's in, done correctly, I think that meets your code, right? Yeah, it has to be not less than R40, but you know, still intending to meet the equivalent value of the area, uh, R value around it. So, Oh, awesome. Yeah. I see Lee actually typed that answer in. Sorry about that. We, we read that one. Um, thanks for the kind words, everybody that liked the presentation. I appreciate it. Um, all the way down to the bottom. Don't you need a vapor barrier on attic duct to avoid condensation, even under cellulose? Steve, I'm gonna I'm gonna refer to you on that one. Um, uh, vapor barrier. Um, just air sealing, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's no direct mention of a vapor barrier on that. You know, duct sealing and and isolating the duct from the ambient air you know, accomplishes the, the outcome of, of uh, anything to, to be concerned with condensation, as you mentioned already too. Right, and Steve, if I could interject, you, it is re you do need for performance purposes, you do need to have an insulated duct with a vapor barrier on the outside of the insulation if you're air conditioning and you have ducts buried in cellulose because you can have condensation develop on the duct work inside the cellulose. So you don't want to have um, cold sheet metal duct in cellulose without 
um, a vapor barrier on the outside of the insulation. So this is kind of to, to Casey's question is, it's not, if you're gonna be putting cooled air through the ducts, it's not enough to just pile cellulose on top of it and say my ductwork in the attic has R40 or R50 insulation over top of it. That meets the insulation requirement, but it sets you up for the potential that you can develop condensation inside the cellulose. So on the outside of the ductwork, but under the cellulose, if you're cooling with those ducts. And I think that's what is being asked there. Yeah, so I, I'm gonna be honest, I don't know um, what product is allowed for that vapor barrier. It, Steve, do you have any idea? No, I mean, and that's not anything specifically defined in the code either. Okay. Um, so, you know, that application of that is going to be circumstantial, I think, you know, and yeah, I, I don't know offhand either what that product would be to, to provide that uh, protection to the duct, you know, especially in metal. But I have a feeling Andy might might have done this in the past. Andy, if you have a, a name of a product for that vapor barrier, if you wouldn't mind throwing it in the chat, that, that, that would be appreciated. Um, <clears throat> just to keep it rolling here, um, Everything's still talking about that same piece. Is it possible to get a, a copy of the recording of the presentation, Bryn? Um, they were asking I don't know if, if you're gonna be sending that out or not. Great question. Um, I'm gonna also pull Andy over to talk. Um, so yes, the, uh, the training is recorded and we'll have the slides um, and documents available. Uh, should have sent that to, everybody should have received the documents by now. Um, but if not, um, you can email me and I'll put my um, email address in the chat. Um, I can make sure that, that you get the documents um, and I will send a follow-up link um, to where to find the recording. Uh, we should be able to post that by Monday or Tuesday of next week. Thank you. And Andy, you should be able to chat if oh, you- okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I'm just talking about, the, I mean, the ducts in the attic should have a um, duct insulation around them that's got a foil vapor barrier that's very carefully sealed and inspected prior to dumping the cellulose on top so that you don't get the condensation problem from vapor, which will migrate right through the cellulose to that cold duct if it's not insulated. Yeah, I got you now. So you're talking about um, like an R8 has a foil face to it and um, it's not enough just to have the R8. It's actually got to be taped. Um, so that way there's, it, it's sealed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I got you. Yeah. It's a place you often see a little lax um, installations and it doesn't, it only takes one decent sized hole to get you water dripping mold issues and sheet rock and so on. That's for sure. Thanks, Andy. So we went a little long. Um, I'm more than happy to stay on as long as people have questions, but I don't want to keep everybody on. I want to <laughs> <Yeah>. close it out. <laughs> um, well, we, I, I think there's great opportunity for some future trainings too. Do you have a, a next slide for your contact information, Chris? So, you know, I, I, I didn't put one in there. Um, so, you know, I would say Mitsubishi wise, you want to reach out to, and I'm just going to stop share. Um, so you'd want to reach out to your, your local area or regional manager, which would be Mike Gambaroni or Joe Armenti. Um, you can obviously access them through your distributor if you're an HVAC contractor and you buy Mitsubishi at any of our distributors. They have a great uh, diamond service group um, technical support team at each one. Uh, they can get a hold of um, any of us. Um, if it's design related, um, what they'll do is they'll send you over to me if it's Mitsubishi. If it's not Mitsubishi, the best way to get a hold of me is if uh, you go to hvacproblog.com and click on the contact tab. Um, that that will go right to my personal email. Awesome. Um, and then just another plug for BBD, um, the the BBD conference next month, April twenty seventh, twenty eighth. Uh, be sure to register for our in person conference. Very much looking forward to folks. Um, seeing folks in person for that. Uh, we do have a survey, a uh, very short survey after this training. If you can just take a moment to give us some feedback, it really does inform what trainings we provide and schedule um, for you all. So uh, please, please 
do take a, a moment or two to complete that. Um, the recording will be posted um, and a link to that will be available in the follow-up email, uh, should be ready uh, to view our early next week. Um, and if you need uh, an attendance certificate, um, again, uh, I see your request, Steve, but if there are any others who needed an attendance certificate, uh, just email me. Um, again, my email is uh, B-O-A-K-L-E-A-F at B-E-I-C dot O-R-G. So um, we can do that for you as well. Um, I think with that, Chris, thank you so much. This clearly was uh, a much needed training and there's a, a lot more that we can get into details. So I'm sure we'll see you again in the near future. Awesome. Um, hope everybody has a great day and uh, a great weekend. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. And don't forget to see Mike or Joe um, at BBD for one of these duck calculators. They'll have them there. I'll see everybody soon. Thanks, Chris. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.